Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We're just going to get started in another minute. So we'll just uh, get situated and uh, we'll start in a second. Good morning and welcome to the webinar, Medicare in 2021. I'm Kayla McNally, the Communications Associate at the Pennsylvania Health Law Project, and I'd like to quickly go over a few items so you can participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to the presenters by typing them into the Q&A pane of the control panel, which should be at the bottom middle of your screen. You may submit your questions at any time during the webinar we will stop to answer them throughout. Please note, this webinar is being recorded and a brief post-webinar survey will launch after the webinar concludes. And then the recording and the survey will be emailed to you after the conclusion of the webinar. If you have technical difficulties at any point, please hang up and dial back into the webinar. If the problem persists, you can email me at event, E-V-E-N-T, at phlp.org. And now I'll turn it over to today's presenters, Erin Gay and Katie McKee. Thank you, Kayla. Good morning, everyone. We really appreciate so many people joining us this morning. We know it's a really busy time and um, thank you for taking time out of your day. So if you've joined us before, we're glad that you joined us again this year to learn about Medicare in 2021. And for people that are joining us for the first time for the Medicare webinar, welcome. Um, Katie McKee and I are gonna be sharing the presentation today We'll kind of go back and forth through the different sections. Um, Katie and I both work out of the PHLP Pittsburgh office. Katie is a supervising attorney and I'm a paralegal. Um, as Kayla said, we will stop for questions at the end of every section. So please, um, please type in your questions as you think of them. And a recording will be sent out um, after the training um, for people to refer back to or possibly use if you're having trouble sleeping and need help being put to sleep. But we hope everyone stays awake today. We have a lot of good information to cover. Um, so with that, let's get started. Okay, so just a quick overview of the Health Law Project in case people aren't familiar with us. We are a free legal, we provide free legal services to people that are having problems getting healthcare coverage and services through government sponsored health programs. So the focus of our work is on Medicaid, but we also do some limited work with Medicare and other um, programs like CHIP or the Marketplace. Um, we are part of the Pennsylvania Legal Aid Network. So like other legal service programs across the state, our services again are free to people, but we're different from the legal service programs because of our very narrow focus and um, also because we don't have an income limit the way that other programs do. So that allows us to help some folks that wouldn't qualify for services through other programs. We have a helpline that people can call us to get help with their personal situation. Um, people call us when they are denied Medicaid, um, when they're denied a service by their Medicaid insurance, if they need help understanding their insurance or understanding how Medicare and Medicaid work together or if they're having problems getting medications or other services because of various barriers. Those are just some examples of when people can call us for help. We do consumer or community education and outreach like we're doing today with trainings about the programs that we work with. We do systemic advocacy to try to um, improve the programs that our clients rely on and um, that we use our client individual work to kind of identify systemic problems and do advocacy to correct them. And then we have a monthly newsletter. So if you're, you know, you might already be on the newsletter list and that's how you found out about the webinar, but if you're not on our newsletter email list and would like to be, um, please send an email to our staff email. This is our newsletter we use to update folks about various developments with Medicaid and other health programs. 
So we're going to talk today about Medicare, give some updates about some changes happening in 2021. We're going to kind of highlight some changes or protections in place during the pandemic, during COVID. We're going to review programs to help with Medicare costs, just to make sure people are aware of them and have that information as you all work with folks to help them, or it might be useful to your own situation or to a family member's or friend's situation. And then we'll end by talking about dual eligibles and community health choices. So just to quickly review Medicare basics, um, I think there's people of all experience and knowledge level on the webinar. So just to make sure that everyone kind of is starting from the same place, just reviewing who gets Medicare. So people, there's three groups of people that are eligible for Medicare. The biggest group is people that are age 65 and older. And then people under the age of 65 can also get Medicare if they've been on social security disability benefits and they've been getting those cash benefits for two years, after that time, they're entitled to Medicare coverage. The only exception to that two year waiting period is people that have Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. Um, people with that condition get Medicare as soon as their cash benefits from social security start. They don't wait the two year period. And then the third group of people who get to Medicare are people that have end-stage renal disease and who get dialysis or who have had a kidney transplant. And those folks can be any age, you know, even children, sometimes if they're in kidney failure and have had a transplant or are on dialysis, they can get Medicare because of their end-stage renal disease. So enrollment for most people is automatic. Um, because most people are getting benefits at age 65 or they're getting social security disability. So if you're known to the social security system and getting benefits from them, the enrollment into Medicare is automatic. But it's not going to be automatic for people that might be turning 65 and who, have, who aren't taking social security benefits yet. And this is going to become more and more common as the retirement age, as the full retirement age increases and more people are working um, at age 65 or even beyond that. So for folks that are turning 65 and are not getting social security benefits, they have to take action to enroll in Medicare if they want it to start when they turn 65. And then the other people that have to flag themselves to social security for enrollment into Medicare are people with end-stage renal disease. And usually, social workers at the dialysis facilities or transplant social workers or transplant coordinators can help, can help with that and get the paperwork needed for enrolling into Medicare under that situation. So there are four main part, there are four parts to Medicare and we're gonna just kind of quickly review them. Medicare part A is also referred to as hospital insurance. This is the part of Medicare that covers inpatient care or care that people get in a facility or home care after you've been in the hospital. So it covers hospitalization, short-term care in a nursing home, hospice care, and home health care. The 2021 costs have not yet been announced. I think last year they were announced at the beginning of November. So possibly within the next couple of weeks, we'll find out what the Part A and B costs are for 2021. The current costs are listed on the slide. Um, most people don't pay a premium for part A. They pay in through either their taxes through if they work, um, there are taxes that are taken out to pay for part A, or people might qualify based on a spouse's work, or um, in the case of young adults with disabilities, they may qualify based on a parent's work history. And then when people get care, you know, there's a deductible that you have to meet if you're hospitalized. And then if you're in the hospital for a long time, you might have daily co-pays start. And then for nursing home care or skilled nursing facility care, Medicare can pay for up to 100 days of skilled nursing care if somebody meets the criteria to get coverage for that long. Um, Days one through 20, there is no charge, but then starting at day 21, there's the copay of $176 per day. So certainly that can um, get expensive very quickly. 
Medicare Part B is also referred to as medical insurance. This covers the outpatient care that you know, most of us get on a regular basis. So this covers doctor's visits, diagnostic tests like MRIs or x-rays, lab work, outpatient surgery, mental health services, durable medical equipment. Those are just kind of some examples of what's covered under Medicare Part B. Again, the cost for next year haven't been announced but are expected soon. Um, the premium, everybody on Medicare pays a premium. This year, it's, again, it's $144.60. For most people, it comes out of their social security check before they get it, if they're getting social security benefits. Um, and then for people with low income and resources, they can qualify for Medicaid to pay that premium, which we're gonna talk a little bit more about later in the training. And then for folks with significant income, they may be paying a higher premium for Part D drug cover, or Part B as in boy coverage. Then there's a deductible that this year is $198. So people pay the first $198 of their Part B covered services. And then after they meet that deductible, Medicare covers 80% and the beneficiary pays 20%. So um, there have been some there's been information released about what the projected Part B premium is for next year, and that seems to be around $153. So it might go up by $10 or so. But again, until the final figures are announced, um, nothing is set in stone. Medicare Part C is, um, is really a, a way for people to get Medicare. It's not so much a benefit. But Part C refers to Medicare Advantage or Medicare Managed Care. So people on Medicare have the option to get their Medicare coverage through what's called Original Medicare or Traditional Medicare, where they use the red, white, and blue card for their A and their B coverage. The other option is for people to get their Medicare through a private insurance company that's contracted with Medicare. And so if somebody joins a Medicare Advantage plan, then they get their Medicare A and B through the Medicare Advantage plan. So again, there's a number of plans available. Katie's gonna talk more about what, you know, the numbers for next year, but um, for folks in Southwestern PA, UPMC, Aetna, Security Blue, Freedom Blue, for folks in the central part of the state, you know, Geisinger's um, one of the Medicare Advantage plans. In Eastern PA, it's um, Aetna again, I think Keystone 65. So there's just a bunch of companies that offer Medicare Advantage plans. And the premiums that people pay, the deductibles they have, their co-pays or co-insurance when they get services, that all varies plan to plan and it can change every year. People that join a Medicare Advantage plan still have to pay that Part B premium so they still have to pay that $144 a month. And then if they're in a Medicare Advantage plan that charges an additional premium, then they, they have to pay that premium as well. Again, all the Medicare Advantage plans offer different benefits. Um, they cover different drugs. And again, this can change every year. These plans differ from original Medicare in one way because they can cover some benefits that original Medicare doesn't cover. And again, Katie's gonna talk a little bit more about this, but these plans can cover dental benefits. They can cover vision benefits. Those are things that are, aren't covered under the original Medicare program. But in exchange, I guess, for getting extra benefits, um, these plans, again, they're managed care. So people have to follow rules in order for their care to be covered. Um, generally speaking, they have to stay within a network. So they can only go to doctors that are in that plan's network. They might have to get referrals to have certain care or services covered. Um, they might have to get prior authorization or their provider might have to get prior authorization before the plan will pay for an MRI or for a surgery. So um, there are rules that people have to follow that aren't, you know, people in original Medicare don't have these rules. People in Medicare Advantage do have to follow the plan rules. And then the Last part of Medicare is Medicare Part D, the prescription drug benefit. And every year, Medicare announces what's called standard Part D costs. And um, 
then I think the insurance companies that offer Part D coverage use the standard cost to determine how, how they're going to set up their cost. So um, we're just going to kind of quickly review the standard cost, but just know that a lot of Part D plans do not follow the standard cost. They have, you know, they have things set up a little bit differently, but in the end, the cost under all the Part D plans have to be what's considered actuarially equivalent to the cost as outlined by the standard benefit. So every Part D plan has a premium. It varies plan by plan. Um, in Pennsylvania next year, the lowest premium for Part D coverage will be $7.30 a month. The highest premium will be $164.40. So it varies. Um, the standard deductible is $445. So if somebody is in a plan that follows this, they'll pay the first $445 of their drug costs. And then, um, and then they'll have some lower costs after that. The initial coverage period, um, people will pay 25% of their drug costs until their total drug costs reach that $4,130 on the slide. Then um, they kick into what's called the coverage gap phase, where right now, and as of this year in 2020, the coverage gap is essentially closed. So people will just continue to pay the 25% until the total out-of-pocket cost reach that 6,500 amount. And then they kick into catastrophic coverage where they're gonna pay 5% or a copay, depending on which one is greater. So if people have been doing this work for a while or people have been covered by Medicare for a while, when Part D first started back in 2006, the coverage gap used to be 100%. So people, when they fell into this coverage gap, really struggled to pay for their prescriptions because they had to pay for 100% of the cost of their prescriptions. The Affordable Care Act um, included provisions to close the coverage gap. So ever since I think 2014, um, <laughs> that may be wrong, but ever for the last several years, the percentage that people are responsible for in the coverage gap has been going down. So as of 2020, the coverage gap has reduced to 25%, which is the same cost in the initial coverage period. So things, you know, but the standard benefit is still kind of divided into these coverage phases. Okay, um, sorry, I keep skipping slides here. Um, so just a little bit more about Part D drug coverage. Part D coverage is offered through standalone drug plans that people who get their Medicare through original Medicare will join to get drug coverage or, their cover, or Part D coverage is through a Medicare Advantage plan. So if, again, if someone's in original Medicare, they're gonna get their drug coverage through a standalone plan if somebody's in a Medicare Advantage plan, they'll get their Part A and B and other health coverage plus prescriptions through the Medicare Advantage plan. Again, whether it's a standalone plan or a Medicare Advantage plan, the drug coverage varies plan to plan, the pharmacy network varies plan to plan. So it's really important that everybody checks their current plan or if they're trying to find a new plan that they're checking to make sure that their drugs are on the list of covered drugs for the plan they're looking at. Plans can have special rules for coverage of certain drugs. So there might be step therapy requirements where you have to try some other medication before a medication would be approved, or there might be quantity limits and maybe a plan is only gonna cover 60 pills a month. And if you need more than that, the doctor is gonna have to get some approval or authorization from the plan. And then for the last several years, plans have been um, identifying certain pharmacies as preferred pharmacies. So if, if a plan has a preferred pharmacy in their network, drugs may cost less than the same medication would cost if you go to a standard um, or non-preferred pharmacy. So just for, as an example, you know, I think my dad's in well care for his drug coverage and I think they have CVS as a preferred pharmacy. So he goes to CVS and gets medications for $0, where if he went to Rite Aid or Walgreens, that same drug might cost him $10. So that's kind of how the preferred pharmacies work. And then individuals with creditable coverage um, may not need Part D. 
And creditable coverage is basically prescription coverage that's as good or better than the Medicare Part D benefit. Some examples of creditable coverage are certain employer or retiree coverage. PACE or PACENET is um, creditable coverage, and we're going to talk more about PACE or PACENET. If somebody is getting drug coverage through the VA, the Veterans Administration, that's creditable coverage. So if somebody has creditable drug coverage, they don't need to have Part D coverage. And then people with Medicaid, so we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about dual eligibles, people with Medicare and Medicaid. If somebody has Medicaid, they do need to be enrolled in Part D drug coverage because Medicaid does not cover drugs when people are on Medicare, with very few exceptions that we'll talk about. But dual eligibles have drug coverage through Part D instead of Medicaid. Okay, so to just cover some Medigap basics, um, Medigaps are Medicare supplemental insurance policies, and they are sold by a whole bunch of, you know, different insurance companies. They are designed to fill in the gaps of Medicare. So they work as secondary insurance to the red, white, and blue Medicare card. These supplement or Medigap policies, they don't cover anything that Medicare doesn't cover. So they don't cover any extra benefits. The best time to join a Medigap is when somebody first goes on Medicare. Otherwise, they might be refused coverage or they could be charged more. Underwriting could apply and they could look at someone's health condition and say, yeah, we'll cover you, but we're gonna charge you a higher premium or we're gonna make you wait for the coverage to start. All of the Medigap plans are standardized. So they're, you know, they're, um, all the plans have a alphabetical letter. So all plan A's cover the same benefit. All plan B covers the same benefit. The difference is the cost amongst the different insurers that offer these Medigap plans. And there's a link to um, a publication that talks a lot more about Medigaps and gives more information. And we encourage people to check out if you have questions or just want to learn more about Medigap coverage. And all the links in the PowerPoint should work for you um, as you're in the handout. So just to touch on some enrollment information um, to complete this section, Medicare's enrollment rules are strict. And there are, you know, there are a lot of rules and they differ depending on whether somebody's trying to enroll in Medicare Part A or B, or someone's trying to enroll in the Medicare Advantage Part C or Part D. Um, there are different enrollment periods that apply that people have to join, have to use to join or change plans. Um, and again, these enrollment periods differ somewhat, um, especially the special enrollment periods between Medicare Part A and B and Medicare Part C and D. So if you don't enroll when you're first eligible, then you could, you'll, you can have a late enrollment penalty or you may have to wait to get coverage. So just an example, again, let's, I'm gonna use my dad. Um, let's say he turned 65 three years ago. And when he turned 65, he didn't take Part B um, for whatever reason but three years go by and now he needs to get into Part B coverage. If he tries to enroll now in October, he's not gonna be able to. He would have to wait until the general enrollment period that starts in January. It goes from January to the end of March. He can sign up for Part B then, but the coverage isn't gonna start until July of 2021. So he's not gonna have coverage when he might need it. And then when the coverage does start in July, he's going to pay a 30% penalty because he waited three years to join, um, to join the Medicare Part B coverage. So it's really important that if people are coming up to age 65, um, that they're really talking to the APPRISE program, to Social Security, or to some other knowledgeable group or person so that they can get the information they need about whether they should enroll or if they delay enrolling, what those consequences are. Because we get a lot of calls from people who didn't enroll in Medicare Part B and now um, are trying to figure out if anything can be done 
for them to get coverage when they need it and not have to pay the late enrollment penalty. So again, there are some resources on the slide here if people want to look for more information and we can certainly address questions people have about this. So we are now in what's called the Medicare annual enrollment period. This is connected to the Medicare Advantage and drug coverage. Every year it runs from October 15th through December 7th. This is when everybody on Medicare can review their health and drug coverage and decide if changes are needed. Anybody who makes a change during this time, the plan, the new plan that they pick will start January 1st. And people are just getting inundated with mail. If you're on Medicare, you know, you're getting a lot of mailings from different insurance companies advertising their plan options. There's, you know, billboards with um, advertisements. There's bus stops or there's advertisements on the sides of buses, at least here in Pittsburgh. Um, there's TV commercials. So um, it's just, it's a busy time and people need to kind of review their information and check to see if their current plan will meet their needs. Because again, plans change every year. And so during this enrollment period, people can enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan or a Part D plan for the first time. They can add or drop coverage, drug coverage, or they can change their Advantage or um, prescription drug plan. Then after this period, so if somebody fails to make a change um, during this enrollment period, um, starts with their new plan in January and finds out that the plan, it, or, I'm sorry, if they continue with their coverage and just finds out, oh, my plan changed and it's not working for me anymore. There might be some opportunities next year for people to still make changes to their coverage. So there's a Medicare Advantage open enrollment period that runs from January 1st to March 31st. During this period, somebody who's in a Medicare Advantage plan can change to a different Medicare Advantage plan or they can disenroll from Medicare Advantage altogether and go back to original Medicare and pick up a Part D plan. This enrollment period does not let somebody in original Medicare join a Medicare Advantage plan. So it allows people in a plan already to change to a different one or disenroll and go back to original Medicare. And then next year, um, there are a bunch of enrollment periods that are called special enrollment periods that help people make changes to their plan during the year if they, if they meet certain criteria. So for dual eligibles and people with extra help, they can make one plan change per quarter, but only for the first three quarters of the year. So again, if someone's a dual eligible, ends up in a plan that doesn't work for them in January, they can change and the new plan will start in February but then they won't be able to make another change until between April and June. Um, there are a bunch of special enrollment periods available. Again, here's a link to a chart, but other examples are when someone moves to a new county within Pennsylvania. If somebody comes from a different state to Pennsylvania, that's gonna give them a special enrollment period. If somebody gets approved for Medicaid or loses Medicaid, that gives somebody a special enrollment period. And then if somebody loses creditable coverage, that's also another opportunity. But again, there are a number of, um, of special enrollment periods available. And then we just wanted to highlight this special enrollment period that's connected to marketing violations or when people are given misleading enrollment information. Because again, it's open enrollment. Um, there's a lot of... Um, People you know, might be reaching out to Medicare beneficiaries and trying to get them to join a plan. Um, unfortunately, people are sometimes told by a broker or an agent, oh yeah, this plan is gonna be great for you. They assure them that their drugs will be covered. They assure them that their providers are in the network. And then the person switches their plan and finds out, oh, my doctor doesn't take this coverage or my drug isn't covered. So if that happens, somebody can contact Medicare, explain what happened, and Medicare can approve a special enrollment period for somebody to get into a plan that does meet their needs. So again, before people change plans or enroll in a plan, they should really be checking with their doctors and health providers to make sure that they take the plan, make sure they understand the rules for the coverage of care, make sure that their pharmacy um, works with the drug coverage and make sure that their drugs are covered. 
Okay, and then my last slide before I turn it over to Katie is just, again, a little bit more information about Medigap enrollments. So again, the best time to join a Medigap plan is in the first six months after somebody has Part B. So during that six month window, a Medigap insurer cannot refuse to give you a, a policy and they can't charge you more based on your health conditions. In Pennsylvania, we allow Medigap, we allow people under 65 to get Medigaps. So if somebody is under 65, they can get a Medigap. And then when they turn 65, they have another open enrollment period. So if they need to change or want to make a change to their Medigap, they can do that. There are also a bunch of what are called guaranteed issue rights. That's where somebody has to be sold a Medigap policy. This typically relates to when somebody loses other coverage. So if somebody had retiree coverage or union coverage that was paying second to Medicare and that coverage is ending, that would give them a guaranteed issue right. If somebody has been in a Medicare Advantage plan and that Medicare Advantage plan is no longer being offered next year, then they would have a guaranteed issue right to buy a Medigap. Unfortunately, losing Medicaid does not grant somebody a guaranteed issue right in Pennsylvania at this time. So that's a, that's a challenge and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that. But if you, again, if you don't enroll in a Medigap during open enrollment for Medigaps, or if you don't have a guaranteed issue right, then plans can deny coverage and they can charge more based on health conditions. And then the final thing we wanted to mention is just a um, kind of obscure rule, but if somebody is on Medicare and they get approved for Medicaid, let's say they need Medicaid long-term care now and they get approved for Medicaid, um, if somebody has a Medigap policy, they can act to suspend the policy short, you know, quickly after they get Medicaid approval. So if I get Medicaid and I want to suspend my Medigap rather than cancel it, then I can request that the Medigap be suspended and I'll have to probably provide a copy of my Medicaid eligibility notice or some other proof that I'm on Medicaid. And this suspension allows somebody to kind of put that plan on hold for two years and then if anything happens within that two year period, that, that policy can be reinstated. And suspension, if you cancel a policy, you probably won't be able to get any Medigap back. So we really encourage people if they have a Medigap and they get approved for Medicaid to suspend it rather than cancel it, just in case there's any issues um, in the next two years, they, they should be able to get that policy back. Okay. so. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Katie and just see if any questions came in about the information we covered so far. Uh, yeah, there are a few questions. Uh, just a reminder to folks, if you have any questions, you can put them into the Q&A uh, box. Uh, should be at the bottom of your screen. Um, Donna asks, if a person was paying the Part B premium but should not have been, can they get reimbursed for the back premium payments taken out? Um, yeah, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But if somebody qualifies for the Medicare Savings Program where Medicaid will pay the premium, um, that can go back up to three months before the month of application if somebody qualified in the previous three months. So there is a chance if you get approved for the Medicare Savings Program that back premiums can be covered. But that's really the only coverage for back premiums, I think. Okay. Um, Lisa asks, um, I thought that, drug that the drug deductible didn't apply to tier one and two and sometimes three. Is that correct? Yeah, so that's a good question. So again, the, the most drug plans don't follow that standard cost sharing. They have a tiered structure like Lisa's mentioning. So tier one and two might be generics, tier three might be kind of lower cost brand name drugs. And the plans decide whether a deductible will apply and to what tiers the deductible does apply to. So yes, I think there are some plans where even if they have a deductible, that deductible may not apply to tier one and tier two drugs. And that's, you know, there's no change to that next year. But you have to look at the details of each plan. Okay, Bernadette asks, 
For the coverage gap, is the total out of pocket from all payers, not just what the member pays? The total out of pocket is what the member pays. It's not what the plan pays. Katie, correct me if I'm wrong about this, if I'm misremembering this, but I think it's what the person pays out of pocket. It's not what the plan pays toward the cost of their drugs. Okay. And Shantae asks, if a participant is having difficulty with accessing care management at their Medicare supplement provider, can they contact PHLP? Um, if they're having problems getting care management through a Medicare plan, I think the better place would be to contact the Apprise program. Um, they can certainly call us. I just don't know that we would be able to do much if they're not on Medicaid as well. Okay. Bill asks, when enrolling in a Medicare supplement plan for the first time, can an individual be denied coverage due to a pre-existing condition? They can if they are outside of the Medigap open enrollment period or if they don't have a guaranteed issue rate. So I guess if somebody had been, let's say somebody 70 years old, they went on Medicare when they turned 65. If they're applying for a Medigap now at the age of 70, um, they're, they don't, they're not in their Medigap open enrollment period. So they could be, they, their, their health conditions could be factored in to either giving them a policy or, or what the Medigap policy charges. Okay. Unfortunately, yeah. Um, Kelly asks, what information is needed to prove a marketing violation or misleading enrollment? Does a verbal comment stating someone was misled uh, suffice or must the customer or must the consumer prove that their PCP doesn't accept the insurance or their pharmacy drug program doesn't accept that insurance? Yeah, I, mean, I think Medicare should be able to check those sorts of things. Um, I think people make the strongest case if they have maybe a card from the agent, you know, again, just use an example where an agent might have talked to me and assured me that the plan that they were wanting to sell me was going to be great and it was going to cover everything I needed. Um, and then I find out that that's not true. If, if the insurance um, agent gives me a card it might be helpful for me to have that information to tell Medicare, you know, generally what that person told me, um, you know, they assured me that my needs would be met and everything would be covered and that just isn't the case. So I think if you can get, if, if you have as much detail, the date that you met with the person, the, you know, the date that you talked to them, that's better, but I don't know that, um, I still think people can make a persuasive case, even if you don't have the details, because I know sometimes it's hard for people to kind of think about all this as they're talking to folks and meeting with people. Okay, Carol asks, um, if someone is under age 65 and new to Medicare, are there only certain Medigap plans that offer coverage to those under age 65? Yeah, that's a good question. Our understanding is yes, that there are only certain policies that are available to people under 65. Um, and again, the Apprise program probably knows this better. I know AARP or United Healthcare is one that does provide people coverage to people under 65, but there may also be other plans available in Pennsylvania. Um, so yeah, I think a prize might know better which ones are available to people under 65, but yes, it is limited. Okay, and um, Janet asks, what is the difference between a Medicare Advantage plan and Medigap plan? Okay, yep, great question. So a Medicare Advantage plan is somebody's Medicare coverage. So they get their Medicare through that Advantage plan. Um, they don't use the red, white, and blue card for their coverage. Let's say I'm in um, Aetna, Medicare Advantage. I go through Aetna to get my Medicare benefits. They cover my A and B and D benefits. Um, and I don't have a secondary insurance if I'm in a Medicare Advantage plan. If I'm in a Medigap, I have my Medicare A and B through original Medicare. That's my first insurance. And then the Medigap is second to that red, white, and blue card. 
So Medicare Advantage, you're only in the Medicare Advantage plan for your Medicare. They can cover things that Medicare doesn't cover. And then if I'm in a supplement, it's my secondary insurance to my original Medicare and the supplement only covers what Medicare covers. That's kind of the most basic distinction. Okay, and then a few people have sent in comments about the Part D gap. Um, Diane says it is what both the plan and subscriber pay regarding the first stage of drug coverage. I do not think that premiums are included, however. And Michael asks if you can clarify the Part D gap. Um, his, he says, my understanding is that the trigger is for what both you and the plan pay towards the $4,130, not just you. Yeah, I think, um, and again, let me look for, I'm going to look for something that's going to illustrate this better when Katie's given her presentation, and then I'll address that after Katie's part. But I think when you're in the initial coverage phase, the 4130 factors in what someone pays and what the plan pays, I think. When you get into the coverage gap and you're trying to get your out-of-pocket cost to that 6,100, you know, that 6,000 level, it's only what I pay that gets counted towards that. It doesn't factor in other people's payments. But I'm going to try to find an illustration that I'll put up after Katie's section um, that hopefully will illustrate this better than I'm explaining it. So Thank, and people are asking great questions. If we can just kind of put a break on this, have Katie talk, we can address more questions um, later on. I just don't want to cut her section short. Okay? Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thanks all for the good questions. We'll continue to address them. Great. Right. Thank you, Erin. And agreed. Thank you for all of those challenging questions. All right, so I'm going to just go over some of the Medicare updates and reminders for 2021. Okay, so there are 33 standalone prescription drug plans available in Pennsylvania for 2021, and we provided the list um, with the PowerPoint and other materials. We provided a list of the 10 zero premium prescription drug plans for duels and others with full extra help. Um, there are a few changes to the list for next year. The basic blue RX standard plan will no longer be offered. There's an, an the Envision RX plan has rebranded and will be called Elixir in 2021. Cigna HealthSpring RX Secure plan will be called Cigna Secure RX. And there is a new zero premium plan choice called Indie Health Saver RX. So those are some of the changes to the zero premium uh, prescription drug plan list for 2021, but we still have lots of options. There's 10 available. Um, there are also a whole lot of Medicare Advantage plans available. Um, the county with the fewest, I forget which one it is now, but even that county has 21 um, plans available. And then there are a few counties in Pennsylvania that have 65 Medicare Advantage plans available, which really is um, sort of an overwhelming amount of choice. But there are plenty of plans available, both health maintenance organization plans, um, where you're going to need a PCP, you'll need referrals to see a specialist, and then also preferred provider organization plans. There are also several um, special needs plans available. Most, most of the special needs plans available are the dual eligible special need plans or DSNPs, um, but there are a couple institutional uh, special needs plans and chronic condition special needs plans. And, Chronic condition plans are for targeted to people with specific chronic health conditions, for example, diabetes or um, dementia or HIV AIDS. Okay, because we deal with a lot of folks who are dual eligible, that's really um, where the focus of our Medicare work is, is working with people who are dual eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. Um, so because of that, we wanted to talk a little bit about the dual eligible special needs plans um, and how they work. So dual special needs plans are just Medicare Advantage plans, um, but they are ones who that limit their enrollment to generally full dual eligibles. There are a couple of plans like the Gateway Assured Ruby plan where you can enroll 
if you just have help with your Part B premium through the State Department of Human Services. But for the most part, most DSNPs are only available to people who are full dual eligibles, meaning they have both Medicare and full Medicaid benefits. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about later in our presentation about community health choices, which is Pennsylvania's newest Medicaid managed care system. Um, all of the community health choices plans are required to have an aligned or companion DSNP, but we do want to remind duals who are in community health choices are not required to join the aligned DSNP. So people who have UPMC community health choices are not required, for example, to enroll in UPMC's DSNP plan. Um, it's also important to remember that the DSNP only provides members with their Medicare coverage, and the person still has Medicaid as a separate insurance coverage that often pays second. So in 2021, all counties in Pennsylvania will have at least two DSNPs available, and most counties have six or more. Um, all of the DSNPs that are currently available are continuing to operate in 2021, and some are expanding into new counties. There are a couple of changes UPMC for Life's dual um, plan will now be called UPMC for Life Complete Care in 2021. Um, Cigna Health Spring Total Care will be called Cigna Total Care. And Humana has added a second DSNP offering that's a preferred provider organization or PPO plan called Humana Choice SNP DE available in several counties around Pennsylvania. And again, we provided a list of DSNPs by county um, with our materials, so you can see that handout for the statewide list. So last year, at the end of August of 2019, um, CMS launched a new Medicare plan finder, which caused a whole bunch of um, kerfuffle, I guess I would say. Um, but so we still have the new plan finder. People, are, I think, are getting more used to it, although we'll talk a little bit about some issues that um, the prize program and other SHIP programs around the country have seen. Um, this is where people can go to compare Medicare Advantage plans, prescription drug plan choices, look up their current coverage, and extra help status. So just as a reminder, this was one of the big changes last year to the Medicare plan finder. Um, you can do general searches and enroll in a plan without creating an account, but generally you're going to want to create an account so that you can save drug lists, save personalized search details, um, or so you can check someone's extra help status. And so to do that, you're going to need to set up an account at mymedicare.gov. Um, for folks who may not have email, you do not need to have an email address to create an account. We have heard from the APPRISE program and other state health insurance programs around the country that they're reporting some problems since open enrollment started with um, some of the plans showing inaccurate pharmacy network information. Um, in some cases, extra help information was not displaying and some plans were not displaying full or accurate drug costs. So I know there was a, an update earlier this week and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are reportedly working with the plans to fix these issues. So, um, you know, people can change their coverage as many times as they need to dur during open enrollment. If someone um, selected a plan based on bad information, um, they'll have uh, the special enrollment period that Aaron talked about there's the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period in January through March. So there are options to change if, if in January, for example, someone discovers, oh, I enrolled in this plan and it turns out I got bad information from the plan finder. Um, so doing things like taking screenshots, um, you know, just like Aaron was talking about earlier, I think, you know, the more proof you have, if you need to report that you've gotten bad information to, um, you know, call 1-800-MEDICARE to report this to try to take advantage of that special enrollment period. Um, the more information you have, the better. Um, but I know that, uh, at least from what I've heard from the APPRISE program, they're, you know, filing complaints with um, Medicare about some of the issues they're seeing. 
All right. So one of the big changes for 2021 is that people with end-stage renal disease can now enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan um, during fall open enrollment with an effective date of January 1st, 2021. So up until now, um, people with end-stage renal disease could not enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan. If they were already enrolled in a Medicare Advantage plan and then developed end-stage renal disease, they could stay in that plan, but they weren't able to switch to another Medicare Advantage plan. Um, so this is a big change. Um, national advocates have raised some concerns about network adequacy and um, plans adjusting networks or costs to discourage people with ESRD from joining um, despite anti-discrimination rules. But really, if a beneficiary who has end-stage renal disease wants to consider enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan, what they should do is just look very carefully um, to make sure that the dialysis facility that they use is in the plan's network. Um, check the plan's costs for dialysis treatment, and also check to make sure their other medications are covered, check the costs for other medical care and treatment they get on a regular basis, and just make sure they understand the plan's rules for getting care. Um, currently, ESRD beneficiaries, as I mentioned, receive their coverage largely through original Medicare. Um, so having a network to deal with um, is a change for folks who are considering enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan. And so the dialysis facilities, dialysis facilities available to them um, could be more limited. So that's important to check. All right, another sort of change is just a further expansion of the um, sort of extra benefits that Medicare Advantage plans are allowed to offer. So for a long time, Medicare Advantage plans have been allowed to cover services that weren't covered by original Medicare. So we've seen, you know, for years, um, Medicare Advantage plans, including routine dental care, routine vision, um, you know, a gym membership, uh, for example. Um, and then starting in 2019, Medicare Advantage plans were given more flexibility to provide new types of these extra benefits, uh, but they still needed to be health related. So we see things like bathroom safety devices, health education, um, transportation and medical appointments, over the counter supplies and medication, um, adult day services. So those are all things that may be offered um, by the plan. And then starting in 2020, Medicare Advantage plans were allowed to add these special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill, um, which are targeted to people with certain health conditions. They do not have to be health related like the other extra health, um, extra health benefits. Um, what has changed for 2021 when this started in 2020, um, these were only targeted to a certain list of chronic health conditions. Um, starting in 2021, um, Medicare Advantage plans have the flexibility to offer these benefits to people with any chronic health conditions. So they still have to make a determination that someone has a chronic health condition before providing these um, special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill, but they can provide some additional benefits like transportation for non-medical needs like grocery shopping, um, potentially pest control, indoor air quality equipment, um, you know, meals furnished to the enrollee beyond a limited basis. So the piece that is a little bit concerning about these special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill is that you don't know a Medicare beneficiary who's contemplating a Medicare Advantage plan won't know until after they've enrolled in the plan and somehow been assessed by the plan whether they'll actually be eligible for these benefits. Um, so no broker should be promising someone that they'll be able to access these special supplemental benefits for the chronically ill because they don't know um, until that person en enrolls. 
So the Medicare plan finder does show, um, you can look at what the extra health related benefits are that are available and also the special um, supplemental benefits. You can contact the plan to get details about these sort of extra benefits that they offer. And if it turns out that someone, um, you know, gets into the plan and discovers they're not going to be eligible for these benefits, and that's really what convinced them to enroll, they can use that Medicare Advantage open enrollment period to change plans. Um, or the um, special enrollment period that Aaron talked about earlier, if they're promised, the example I gave, if someone is promised by a broker that they're going to be eligible for these plans, that would be a um, the kind of violation that they could use that special enrollment period to change plans. Okay. So another change for 2021, CMS is testing a Part D senior savings model, which allows Part D sponsors through these enhanced alternative plans to offer plans that cap beneficiary co-pays to $35 for a 30-day supply of insulin. Um, and there are plans available that are both standalone prescription drug plans and Medicare Advantage plans. Not all plans are going to offer this. They have to be um, participating, a plan participating in the senior savings model. Um, the plan should be identified in the plan finder. There is supposed to be a filter to identify plans that will offer these capped out-of-pocket costs for insulin. Um, and we have a link to more information here. And when I was reading over it, I learned that at least according to CMS, one in every three Medicare beneficiaries has diabetes and over 3.3 million Medicare beneficiaries use one or more of the common forms of insulin. So this hopefully will be a very helpful change. Um, you know, obviously insulin can be very expensive. And so the goal here is to lower beneficiaries out of pocket costs um, by offering a broad set of formulary insulins available at a stable $35 copay. Um, so this is a voluntary program for drug manufacturers and for Part D plan sponsors or Medicare Advantage plan sponsor plan sponsors. Um, for this year, there are a couple of um, drug manufacturers partic participating, Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk, and Sanofi Adventus. Um, and as I mentioned, plans have to be considered an enhanced alternative plan to participate. But it looks like um, CMS published a list of insulins covered through this program. It includes some common varieties like Humalog, Novolog, Humalin, um, Lantus, to name a few. So um, plans may include some or all of the insulins on their formulary. So we'll see you know, how this goes, but this is a change for 2021. Another program we wanted to mention is the Opioid Treatment Benefit Program, also known as OTP. So this was new last year, um, but we wanted to just provide some information about this because Medicare Part B now covers um, opioid use disorder treatment services provided by um, opioid treatment programs. Um, so this new benefit establishes Medicare's coverage of methadone for the first time, um, in addition to some other treatments that were already covered. And the services are provided at no cost if the beneficiary receives the services from an opioid treatment program that is enrolled in Medicare. However, the Part D, or I'm sorry, Part B is in boy deductible does apply. Um, and you can find enrolled Medicare OTP programs on medicare.gov. So under this new benefit, Medicare covers medication assisted treatment, substance abuse counseling, individual and group therapy, um, toxicology testing, intake activities, periodic assessments. Um, and as long as there, the COVID public health emergency um, is in effect counseling and therapy services as well as the periodic assessment will be covered if they're conducted by telephone or video. 
So if someone is considering um, changing their plan or enrolling in a Medicare Advantage plan, they'll just want to check, um, contact that plan to learn about the plan network limitations and copayment requirements prior to receiving treatment. Okay. Um, something new for original Medicare is original Medicare is adding an acupuncture benefit. Um, this will be covered by Part B. It is only offered to treat chronic low back pain. Um, Medicare Part B will cover up to 12 acupuncture visits in 90 days if the chronic back pain has lasted 12 weeks or longer, has no identifiable systemic cause, and the pain is not associated with surgery or pregnancy. And then if um, the beneficiary is showing improvement, they can cover an additional eight sessions, uh, but no more than 20 will be given yearly. And if the back pain is not improving or is getting worse, the treatments will not be covered. And the acupuncture must be given by a doctor or other healthcare provider um, who has certain qualifications um, and is, uh, has an active license to practice acupuncture. All right. So another addition, there's a new reminder letter um, that's going to start being sent sometime later in 2020 to folks who are newly eligible for Medicare. So the people who will be getting this letter will be folks who already got the welcome to Medicare packet. Um, it's sent one month before Medicare starts just to remind people to learn about Medicare, you know, review the benefits and make their coverage choice. So this will only go to people who are already collecting social security retirement or social security disability benefits at age 65. Um, so as Erin mentioned earlier, a lot of folks, you know, as people's full retirement age is later or as people wait longer to enroll, uh, to sign up for social security retirement benefits, um, those folks have to remember to identify themselves to um, Social Security and enroll in Medicare at 65 because they don't get the benefit of these Welcome to Medicare packet or this new letter. There's also a new notice being mailed to all marketplace enrollees a few months before they turn 65. So if someone is in a marketplace plan, um, they'll be getting a letter uh, reminding them about enrolling in Medicare. Um, when they need to do that. And since we're talking about this, we just wanted to remind folks that there is an opportunity for equitable relief for people who stayed in a marketplace plan after they became eligible for Medicare. So sometimes this happens, someone was in a Medicare, um, in a marketplace plan, you know, they, they like their plan, they turn 65, they don't enroll in Medicare, not realizing that they need to do that. Um, so for people who should have enrolled in Medicare by June 30th of 2020, they can still request equitable relief if they failed to enroll in Part B um, because they stayed in a marketplace plan. And then if the equitable relief is, is granted, that can eliminate or reduce the late enrollment penalty. All right, um, another new option uh, for people who get direct bills from Medicare for premiums is to pay their premium online in certain instances. So currently there are 2.2 million beneficiaries that are direct, directly billed for their Medicare premium payments. And as I just mentioned, um, CMS foresees this number increasing as people are enrolling in Medicare and are not taking social security benefits because they're still working or because they're, um, you know, for a variety of reasons. So there are um, currently over 500,000 people paying online. So this premium can be paid through the beneficiaries My Medicare account by selecting the My Premium tab and clicking on the Pay Now button. Um, people can pay by credit or debit card, and their My Medicare account will also provide instructions on how the beneficiary can sign up for auto pay or easy pay. 
Um, and then they'll be able to see their premium amount, their payment history in their My Medicare account. Um, people cannot pay their Medicare Advantage or Part D prescription drug plans online through their My Medicare account. So this is limited to um, people who get direct bills for um, Part A, Part B, or if they have a Part D IRMA payment. Okay, and I am going to stop screen sharing to turn it back over to Erin, but um, Kayla, do we have any questions at this point? Yes, we do. Um, okay, Michael asks, so other than zero premium, what generally is the major advantage for a dual eligible to be in a DSNP versus an ordinary Medicare Advantage plan? Well, I think that's a good question. Um, honestly, sometimes I don't know. I think there's supposed to be some care coordination between the, um, you know, Medicare and Medicaid, but I have not really seen that happening. So if some people like the extra benefits that the DSNPs offer. Often they offer, for example, Gateway Assured Diamond Plan offers a pretty good dental benefit. So people like that. So sometimes those DSNPs offer more benefits that people like, but otherwise, I mean, especially for folks in rural areas who may not have a lot of doctors available, being in a, a DSNP if they also have Medicaid really just limits the doctors that they can see because they are now in a limited network. They're in a Medicare Advantage plan with a network. Um, and so often for those folks, original Medicare might be the better option if it gives them the opportunity to access more doctors. And then they have Medicaid as their secondary insurance so that they're not responsible for the 20% coinsurance that comes with original Medicare. So I think that's a good, a good question. I wonder about that myself. Okay, next we have a comment from Diane. Diane says, here in Montgomery County, there's lots of competition among MA plans regarding over-the-counter health and wellness products allowances for all members. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for that, um, Diane. Janet asks, does OTP cover inpatient rehab? Hmm, I am not sure about that. Let me look back at my notes. I don't think so. I think that would be covered under Part A because this is a Part B benefit. Um, but Erin, I don't know if, do you have a better answer to that? I don't, but we, well, we can check on that. Sure. Okay. And Janet asks, back to the 6,550 out of pocket, does it go back to how much you spent while the drug plan plays it pays its share or does it start from the $4,130 including your deductible or do you subtract 6,500 minus the 4,130? Okay, this is Erin. Um, can folks see on the screen? Um, and thank you for all the questions about this. I think we've been working with people who are, have low income and get the extra help for so long that I think we forget about kind of all these nuances with the um, coverage gap. So if people can see, and I put this in the chat to folks, the things that count towards that 60, um, that 60 some, that amount that you have to get to get out of the coverage gap is the deductible, it's what you pay during the initial coverage period. It's what you pay for the brand name drugs during the donut hole or coverage gap, plus the amount of the manufacturer discount, because that's kind of, that, the manufacturer discounts play into the coverage gap reduction. Um, and then if somebody like a family member helps you pay, or if you get help from a charity, that those payments count towards the, um, that 6,000 figure. And then if somebody is in PACE or PACENET, that's a state pharmaceutical assistance program or one of these other programs, then the amount that that program pays would count towards the out-of-pocket costs. So those are the only things that count towards the out-of-pocket costs to help you reach, to get through that coverage gap period. But what the plan pays does not count during the coverage gap. 
So hopefully this helps clarify this and sorry for giving bad information before. Okay, and then just so everyone knows that is in the, um, the chat, that information that Erin just shared. So you can refer to it there. And while I'm in the chat, I see that there are a few questions. And just a reminder to folks, the best way to get your question answered is to put it in the Q&A pane. But I see Wanda asked, how long does a person have to discover that they were enrolled by a broker or agent into a plan that does not cover their medications? Yeah, I don't know that there's any, um, I haven't seen any time frame in these, you know, in the special enrollment description. Um, I think possibly it can be a harder case if you've been in a plan for six months, you know, and then just realize, but if you're someone that doesn't use a lot of healthcare, you know, maybe there's a reason you're, it took you six months to notice. So um, there isn't a time frame in the rules that I've seen. Okay, so I think there's about two more questions that we can do right now. Um, Martha asks, if a consumer enrolls in Part A at age 65, but has creditable Part B, D coverage through an employer plan, when they no longer work and want to go to a Medigap policy at a later age, does that meet the guaranteed ability to go on to a Medigap plan? I think, yeah. and I'll look at the, um, I'll look at this chat question more closely after this next section, but the, the open enrollment period for Medigap starts when your Part B as in boy enrollment starts, and it goes for six months after the Part B as in boy is active. So if you are delaying your Part B enrollment because you're still working and covered by your employer, and let's say you join uh, Medicare at age seven, Medicare Part B at age 70, then for the first six months at that time that you have Part B, you are in your Medigap open enrollment period. So it's six months from when your Medicare Part B starts, and then it resets if your Medicare starts before age 65. Okay, and then last question for now. Lisa asks, if you have an Advantage plan and have, and have not made changes in open enrollment to your plan, can you still change your plan in the Advantage general enrollment period from January to March? Yes. Yeah, Lisa, even if you don't make a change during open enrollment, the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period, it's the, um, yeah, the Medicare Advantage open enrollment period is still available to folks who are in a Medicare Advantage plan on January 1st. Okay, great. And those are all the questions for right now. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. You guys are asking really great questions. So it's, um, I know Katie and I jo enjoy these webinars more when people ask questions. So we appreciate that you're so engaged this morning. Um, so keep the questions coming. Okay, so we just wanted to kind of highlight some changes or some rules and protections that are in place right now because we're in the middle of the pandemic. So even though this is a training about Medicare, we're talking some about Medicaid as well, and just wanted to flag to people that since March 18th, the county assistance offices have not been able to terminate people from Medicaid coverage or reduce people's Medicaid benefit. So um, this protection is currently in place until January 21st of 2021. If the federal government extends the declaration of the public health emergency, then the end date might be extended into the future. But so between March 18th and January 21st, 2021 at this point, people should not have been cut off Medicaid or they shouldn't have their Medicaid be reduced maybe to just the payment of the Part B premium. So, um, we just wanted to make sure people know this. We've certainly talked to some a handful of people, maybe more, that have had a problem with this. Um, so if you encounter anybody that gets a notice terminating them from Medicaid before January 21st of 2021, 20, please reach out to us so we can try to help address that. Um, so in this, just to kind of quickly note, this is good that people aren't losing coverage in the middle of a pandemic. And one of the challenges of this 
is that for people turning age 65 that are on Medicaid and really wouldn't be eligible for Medicaid if this protection was not in place, that because now we're beyond six months that this has been in place, that this is affecting people's ability to get into a Medigap during that open enrollment period. So if you have anybody in that situation, you know, please reach out to the Apprise program, please reach us, out to us at the Health Law Project and we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, I know that there is some advocacy being done um, at the state level. I just don't know if that will ultimately result in possibly having a guaranteed issue related to losing Medicaid. Um, so, you know, just stay tuned. We'll see what develops over the next um, several months regarding this. So just some other changes being made during the pandemic. Um, Social Security offices have largely been closed to the public um, since the start of the pandemic. So people can enroll into Medicare online if they're enrolling into Medicare A and B through the link here on the slide. Um, and Social Security is also allowing people to fax enrollments for part A and B. And they've also kind of lessened some of the rules around paperwork. So for people that are still working and are delaying enrolling into part B because they're covered by their employer plan, um, there's a form that employers have to fill out when somebody goes to enroll in Medicare that basically, you know, verifies the dates that they were employed and verifies the dates that they were covered. And, you know, um, employer, employers may not be able to do that. Maybe the employer is shut down or maybe for other reasons, the employer is not able to fill out that paperwork. So Social Security is kind of giving some flexibility there and allowing the beneficiary to fill out that form as best as possible and submit other information that can verify that they've been working like pay stubs or W-2s or that they've been covered, you know, maybe a copy of an ID card if the ID card has policy dates on it. So it's good that those flexibilities are in place. And then there's also something called this pandemic related equitable relief. And this is for people that, um, miss the opportunity to enroll in Medicare Part A or B between March and June, these dates on the slide. Um, so if somebody, you know, let's say somebody was on Part A already, but they had planned to enroll in Part B during the general enrollment period. And if for some reason they waited till the end of March to do that, and they weren't able to enroll because um, they waited, you know, until March 20th to do that. Um, if they miss that enrollment period, they just have to contact Social Security, explain the situation, and Social Security would hopefully review them for this pandemic equitable relief um, situation. So there are nuances. Somebody has to have been in an enrollment period and have not already taken action to enroll into Medicare for this to work. But um, I guess if people have questions about this or need have a beneficiary that needs help with this, reach out to the Apprise program is probably the best resource. Uh, but people can also follow up with us. And then for health and drug enrollments, um, there's a special enrollment period related to declared disasters or government declared disasters. And this now is brought in to include other emergency special enrollment periods like we're in with COVID. So if, um, if the federal public health emergency declaration does end January 21st, 2021 and isn't extended, then people would have this SEP to change plans, change their Medicare Advantage or drug plans um, up until, you know, the March of next year um, through this SEP. So just kind of flagging these enrollment um, changes. And then wanted to just highlight some coverage changes related to COVID. So one big change with Medicare is the expansion of telehealth services. Um, prior to COVID, original Medicare did not cover telehealth services. Um, so that has changed and it covers doctor's visits, mental health counseling, preventive health screenings, um, where they were medi original Medicare will pay for these services that are delivered through telehealth. Um, Medicare Advantage plans had been able to do that already because um, they can do they can you know cover beyond what original Medicare covers. So I think a lot of national advocates are hoping that the telehealth expansion or flexibilities will remain even after COVID has ended. But um, but it is available now during COVID. 
COVID testing is covered by Medicare Part B um, since February, and it should be covered at no cost to the beneficiary as long as the person is going to a provider that is enrolled in Medicare or that's a participating provider with the Medicare Advantage plan if that's how they get their coverage. I know we're all hoping that a vaccine is developed. And so once one is developed and available to people, then Medicare Part B will cover the COVID vaccine at no cost to beneficiaries. Another flexibility that's in place is if somebody is needing to get a 90 day supply of medication, then their standalone drug plan or Medicare Advantage plan has to cover a 90 day supply when that's requested. And then the last thing, we're still trying to sort through some of this information about this, but at the beginning, um, I mentioned that under Part A, Medicare will cover up to 100 days of skilled nursing if somebody meets the criteria for that coverage. Um, given the pandemic, um, if somebody needs to be in a skilled nursing facility longer than 100 days, the skilled nursing facility can work with um, the Medicare coverage to try to get approval for additional days beyond 100 days to be covered. Our understanding is that there's a lot of practical challenges with this. So um, if people are faced with this issue, you know, reach out to a prize or reach out to us and we can try to get you some more information about this. But just wanted to highlight that technically it's available to people. Okay, I just wanna quickly cover some of the programs that help with Medicare costs. And this is information for those of us that have joined us before. This is a little bit of a review, um, so just hang with us. Extra help is tied to the Medicare prescription drug benefit. So it's a Medicare benefit connected to Medicare Part D as in drug. There are two levels of extra help that people can get. Um, and any level of extra help lowers the premiums that people pay. It lowers or eliminates the deductibles. And it lowers or eliminates co-pays that people have to pay. Another big bonus of the extra help is that if somebody is subject to a Part D late enrollment penalty, once they get approved for extra help, that penalty gets wiped away and remains wiped away even if somebody loses extra help in the future. So to get extra help, um, if somebody's on Medicaid, getting any Medicaid benefit, even if it's just payment of the Part B premium, they automatically qualify for full extra help. Otherwise, if someone's on Medicare and not getting Medicaid, then they have to meet income and resource limits to qualify. These resource limits are the current 2020 limits. The limits for 2021 have not been announced. I think in past years, this happens in December. So these figures will change for 2021 and the income limits for the power, the income limits will change when the federal poverty levels get adjusted next year. Um, so just real quick to highlight for resources, the extra help does not count life insurance, it doesn't count any motor vehicles, it doesn't count the consumer's home, it doesn't count um, burial plots, so um, not all income and resources count. So if you have somebody that seems close to these limits or you just want to review someone's situation to see if they might be eligible, you know, feel free to reach out to us or reach out to the Apprise program and we can kind of get into the specifics of that person's situation. If this slide covers what the costs are for people that get extra help. Um, so with full extra help, you know, if someone joins one of those 10 plans on the list that Katie mentioned, they will have no premium for their drug coverage. They have no deductible. Then their co-pays, um, people that are getting waiver services or who are in a nursing home on Medicaid have zero copay for their prescriptions. Otherwise, people pay small copays depending on their income. These are going up a little bit. Um, next year, it'll be $1.30 for generic or $4 if people have the lowest income. Otherwise, they'll pay $3.70 for generic and $9.20 for brand name drugs. And then the partial help, again, uh, reduces people's costs, but people do have to pay a deductible of $92, that's of course, if they're in a plan where the deductible would be higher than that. If somebody joins a plan and there is no deductible, they will not pay a deductible. It just limits the deductible to $92. Then people have a 15% coinsurance and small co-pays after they reach um, the catastrophic coverage phase. 
So again, for dual eligibles, people that have Medicare and Medicaid, they automatically get full extra help. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to apply. The extra help, once it gets turned on, it, it is turned on for the entire calendar year. And for anybody currently on Medicaid, so again, because we have this continuous eligibility protection through COVID, anybody that has Medicaid today, October 28th, has already been approved for extra help for all of 2021. And the extra help stays on even if someone loses their Medicaid next year after the COVID protections end. We, you know, before COVID, people would call us, um, you know, who are dual eligibles, who are losing their Medicaid coverage. And their biggest fear was being able to afford their prescription drugs. And again, extra help does not end when your Medicaid ends. It at least lasts for the rest of the calendar year. And in, so, in some cases, depending on if you lose your coverage through Medicaid through the last six months of the year, the extra help is already turned on for the next calendar year. In order to check the status for someone's extra help, they can log into mymedicare.gov, but you have to have an account. That's the only way to check the extra help status for somebody now since the plan finder changed, as Katie mentioned. And people can always call 1-800-MEDICARE and find out about their extra help status. People that need to apply for extra help can do so through Social Security's website. That's the recommended way to do it. Um, because if you mail a paper application, it has to be an original application and the applications that are available are years out of date. Um, and the online application gets processed quicker anyway. People can apply for extra help at any time there's no deadlines, there's no time limits. If somebody needs help, you know, please call the Apprise program. Um, they can help people apply if needed. And then anybody that applies for extra help should get a written notice back saying, you know, saying that they've been approved for extra help or denied. And if they're denied, they can appeal that. This is just a reminder about mailings that come in the fall. Um, if somebody is no longer gonna be automatically eligible for extra help next year, if they lost their Medicaid prior to COVID in January or February or early March, um, they would get a notice on gray paper. They can apply, they still might be eligible. They might just have to apply for it and meet income and resource guidelines. People whose extra help copay is changing next year will be getting an orange letter this month. And then every year, Social Security selects um, some people who have applied through Social Security and been approved. They select a certain number of people to do a redetermination. So if somebody is selected for redetermination, they have to fill out the redetermination paperwork. Otherwise, their extra help will end at the end of the year. This link is to a whole bunch of Medicare mailings, and it's really helpful sometimes, especially for for us that get calls from people that get notices, we can go on this and look at it and read the notice that the person received. Okay, so just to quickly cover the Medicare Savings Program. These programs are a Medicaid benefit. They are connected to Medicare Part B, but it's the Medicaid system that offers these programs. They're sometimes also called Medicare buy-in. Um, if somebody's eligible, the state pays the Medicare premium and then it, Medicare Part B premium. And then for folks with the least amount of income, they would also get help with Medicare cost sharing in addition to the payment of the Part B premium. Again, one big benefit for people who are eligible for the Medicare Savings Program is that if they would be subject to a Part B late enrollment penalty and they get approved for the Medicare Savings Program, that Part B late enrollment penalty gets wiped away and it's gone for the rest of the time, um, even if somebody loses the Medicare Savings Program, provided they continue to have coverage through Part B. And it can also help somebody maybe who didn't enroll in Part B. Um, if somebody has Part A and they put off enrolling in Part B, if they're eligible for the Medicare Savings Program, then they get into Part B the month that the Medicare Savings Program starts. So we can also help people get into Medicare Part B during the year. It's the county assistance offices that determine eligibility. To get the Medicare Savings Program, people have to meet these income and resource requirements. 
Um, not all income and resources count. So if somebody is working, only half of that income counts toward the limit. Um, resources, you know, a house doesn't count. Um, one car doesn't count. Um, so there's other resources that do not count towards this limit. So we really encourage people to apply for this program if they seem like they would be eligible. There's a paper application that can be completed. Um, that's what we recommend because it's a much shorter application than the Compass application. Um, it's a much shorter and more straightforward application. So again, there's a link to the application through, through the slide. People can apply at any time. A prize can help people that need it. And then the county assistance office will send somebody a notice saying that they're eligible. This is the day that we're going to start to pay your Medicare Part B premium. And if they get approved this month, and maybe the Part B premium continues to come out of the check in November and December, maybe, then Medicaid or Social Security will refund you for the premiums you paid after the Medicare savings program started. Okay, the last slide I'm going to cover is just a reminder about PACE and PACENET. This is a great prescription program for people that are age 65 and older in Pennsylvania. The income limits are on the slide um, and they look at last year's income and they do not count the amount people pay for the Part B premium towards the limit. So again, there's about $1,200 that won't count towards the income limit if people are paying the Part B premium. Um, applications are processed really quickly, um, usually within a week, and people can have their prescription coverage only through PACE or PACENET or it also works as secondary to a Medicare Part B program. And PACE has really good coverage, so we encourage people, if you're working with an older adult that's struggling with prescription costs and they're not eligible for full Medicaid, um, look at PACE and PACENET to see if that's a resource for them. Okay, with that, um, Katie, do you want to you want to stop here for a couple questions or do you want to kind of continue on and we'll take questions at the end? Um, let's see. Yeah, let's do questions at the end, I think, just okay. for time limits. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Um, so we just wanted to go over, because we do a lot of counseling, as I mentioned earlier, of folks who are dual eligible, we just wanted to go over some dual eligibility basics. Um, when folks have both Medicare and Medicaid, um, we have this slide to show they're gonna have a whole bunch of cards in their wallet. They may not know which is which. Sometimes we talk to people and they say, all I know is I have Aetna or all I know is I have Gateway, you know, whatever it is. Um, and so then you have to kind of parse down into what their coverage is, but somebody's going to have their uh, red, white, and blue Medicare card, their Medicare Advantage card, or their um, prescription drug card, um, the access card if they're on Medicaid, and then most folks who are dual eligible who are on Medicaid are now in the Community Health Choices Program with some exceptions, so they're going to have a card for that plan. So, you know, they're, they're juggling a lot of... Um, a lot of cards and two complicated programs. Um, so just some basics. Medicare is always going to be their primary insurance if they're dual eligible for Medicare and Medicaid. Medicaid is always the payer of last resort. So for services that are covered by Medicare Part A or B, Medicare is billed first and then Medicaid is billed second to cover Medicare deductibles, coinsurance, and copays. Um, just a reminder that Medicaid does not pay second to Medicare Part D, and someone who has Medicaid does have to be enrolled in a Part D prescription drug plan. And if they don't enroll in one, they will be auto-enrolled into one. Um, Medicaid does pay second to um, Part A and B. So sometimes if there is a prescription or medical supply that's covered by Part B as in boy, um, Medicaid will pay second in that case. Um, and Medicaid cannot require that someone has Medicare Part B because it's something that folks have to pay for. Um, Medicaid cannot require that someone is enrolled in that. Um, Medicaid 
will cover some, will be the primary insurance for things that Medicare doesn't cover. So there are dental benefits in Medicaid vision, Medicaid, the adult benefit package covers incontinence supplies, over-the-counter medications. So for the things that Medicare doesn't cover, that Medicaid does, Medicaid is going to be the um, primary coverage. And for both, both on the Medicare and on the Medicaid side, for people who are dual eligible, there are certain billing protections. Okay, so people who are dual eligible, and we talked about this a bit earlier, they can enroll in any Medicare plan they choose. So they're not limited to dual special needs plans just because they're available to them. Um, they can enroll in any um, Medicare plan of their choice. That could be original Medicare and a prescription drug plan, a Medicare Advantage or a DSNP. Um, and Aaron talked about this, that as long as they enroll in a zero premium, prescription drug plan, they won't have to pay anything because people on Medicaid automatically get extra help, full extra help. Um, but if they choose a plan that has a higher premium, they may have to pay part of that premium. Um, and they do get dual eligibles, get that quarterly special enrollment period when they can change their coverage. So we do a good bit of counseling of new dual eligibles, just because there are a lot of changes happening to their health insurance and that transition can be really challenging, um, especially for people who have been on Medicaid and are now becoming Medicare eligible because their eligibility for Medicaid when they turn 65 has to be reassessed. Um, their Medicaid coverage is going to change if they're still eligible you know, the, there are many more Medicare options available to people than there are Medicaid options. Um, and so that can be confusing. And then how the insurances work together is confusing. Um, I did see a question in the chat about this, but during COVID, one additional point of confusion because of the moratorium on ending medical assistance coverage, people who would normally lose their Medicaid at 65 because they're eligible for the MOD program or um, MAGI Medicaid are staying on Medicaid for a longer period because of this moratorium on ending anyone's Medicaid benefits. Um, so the, if you turn 65, enroll in Medicare Part B, you still have Medicaid. Um, the fact that you still have Medicaid doesn't extend that open enrollment period for Medigap. So Aaron talked about this, that when someone becomes, um, enrolls in Part B, they get a six month open enrollment period to enroll in a Medigap plan. Um, a Medigap is not allowed to sell a Medigap plan to someone who is on Medicaid. So for people who are on Medicaid and they know they're going to lose it at some point, they know they want to enroll in a Medigap plan they're going to likely need to take steps to affirmatively end their Medicaid coverage. So even though there's a moratorium on, and on the county assistance offices or the Department of Human Services terminating people's Medicaid coverage during the public health emergency, people can choose to withdraw from the Medicaid program um, and they can contact their county assistance office or our office if they wanna talk about that. Um, for, Sometimes there's a challenge for people getting medications um, when they transition, uh, when they become dual eligible. You know, when they're on Medicaid, if someone's on Medicaid only, Medicaid is covering all of their prescription drug costs. Um, when they become Medicare eligible, um, assuming they just have standard Medicaid and aren't in a nursing home or on a waiver program, they're going to start having co-pays. And that can often be a real challenge to people with low incomes to have to start paying co-pays for their medications. Um, we just wanted to remind people that if someone doesn't yet have Part D coverage, they've enrolled in Medicare, that the Humana Lynette program is available. Um, and we have listed here the number for the Lynette Health help desk. It's answered in my experience. They're super helpful. Um, so Linet is the limited income newly eligible transition program. It's designed to help people who qualify for extra help but have not yet enrolled in a Part D plan. 
So like we talked about, when someone becomes Medicare eligible, but they're on Medicaid, they lose their Medicaid coverage for prescription drugs. That has to come through Medicare. Um, so if they haven't yet enrolled in a Part D plan, they can sign up for LINET so they can get their prescriptions while they're working on signing up for a Part D plan. Um, the, it's time limited. Um, the coverage is temporary, usually can last for about two months. Um, during that time, you're supposed to enroll in a Part D plan and you'll be auto enrolled if you have not chosen one. Um, you can seek to enroll in LINET at the pharmacy, but generally it's easier to just call LINET before going to the pharmacy um, to try to get that in place. Uh, one thing I did want to mention, I just realized there is some confusion um, for people who are becoming Medicare eligible and they have been on Medicaid over whether they're going to be eligible for the Medicare savings program that Erin just talked about and whether um, they'll get help with the Part B premium. So just a reminder that people don't automatically get help with the Part B premium. They have to separately meet the income and resource limits in order to qualify for that program. Okay, so now that Community Health Choices is live in all of Pennsylvania, we wanted to just go over that briefly. Um, Community Health Choices is Pennsylvania's newest Medicaid managed care system. And we wanted to talk a little bit about who is impacted by this program. So the majority of people in Community Health Choices are just regular old dual eligible. So people who have Medicare and Medicaid, there are some exceptions. People don't go into Community Health Choices if they become Medicare eligible before they're 21 if they're enrolled in one of the intellectual disability or autism waiver programs, or if they're getting services um, through the county ID system. Again, people who are in, um, who are receiving home and community-based services through a waiver program with the exception of um, the ID and autism waivers um, go into community health choices. So all of the physical health waivers um, with the exception of the OBRA waiver um, were consolidated into the Community Health Choices Waiver. So all of the people in Community Health Choices Waiver go into uh, the Community Health Choices system. And then nursing home residents, um, they go into Community Health Choices when Medicaid is paying for their care, unless they're in a state veterans home. So we just wanted to give you an idea of what the CHC population looks like. Um, OLTL, the Office of Long-Term Living, which is part of the Department of Human Services that oversees the Community Health Choices Program, um, publishes data um, about the program. And so you can see that the majority of people in this program are what are known as healthy duals, dual eligibles who are not otherwise, who aren't in a waiver program, they're not in nursing homes, and then a smaller subset of the population are those in the waiver in nursing homes. So CHC um, was rolled out over a couple of years and now all of Pennsylvania is covered by community health choices. There are three managed care plans um, available that people can choose from, PA Health and Wellness, UPMC Community Health Choices, um, in Southeast, it is Keystone First Community Health Choices, and in the rest of Pennsylvania, it's Mayor Health Caritas um, Community Health Choices Plan. So we just wanted to provide the um, contact information for these plans. The Department of Human Services through the Office of Long-Term Living pays these Community Health Choices plans and also monitors them. Um, and they are required to offer the normal adult benefit package. So just a reminder, because there was a lot of confusion about this when CHC started, and there may still be some, especially in um, the part of Pennsylvania where community health choices is still relatively new, that Medicare does not change under community health choices. People's eligibility for when they can enroll in Medicare doesn't change. Their plan choices don't change. Um, Medicare remains the primary coverage. Um, and just a reminder that 
the community health choices plans can pay second to Medicare for services that Medicare covers, whether the provider is enrolled in that community health choices plans network, and even if the provider is not Medicaid enrolled. Now, we know that there are practical challenges related to this. Um, sometimes providers don't understand this or they don't want to work with a certain insurance and they are allowed to, to make those choices. But um, providers, Medicare providers can bill someone's community health choices plan um, regardless of whether they are in that network or not. And the community health choices plan cannot impose its own rules for accessing Medicare cover services. So there may be a service that um, if you are in Medicaid only would require prior authorization, but Medicare would not require that. Um, the plan, the community health choices plan can't require prior authorization. People are allowed to change their community health choices plan at any time. Um, you know, if they, make the switch before the second Thursday of the month, the new plan starts the first of the next month. Otherwise it would start um, the month after. So right now, if somebody called the independent enrollment broker today to change their plan, um, their change would be effective December 1st. And there are situations where um, we have helped people get an expedited switch. Um, so you can call, people can call us if they have that issue. So the independent enrollment broker um, does the community health choices plan enrollment and helps people change plans. Um, and at a different phone number is also available to help people apply for the home and community-based services waiver. So we just wanted to provide this information more as a resource than anything. Just briefly, because we do get a lot of questions about this, for people who are interested in applying for the Community Health Choices Waiver to get those services in their home, there is a process um, for doing that. And the process can take up to 90 days to complete. Um, so people call the independent enrollment broker, there's a visit, um, they have to go through an assessment, um, get a certification from their doctor that they need the level of care required to qualify for the waiver. Um, and then if they're found to meet the um, level of care requirements to qualify for the waiver, they go through a financial eligibility assessment at the county assistance office. Um, so folks who are denied eligibility for the waiver because they don't meet the clinical requirements, they're not found to be nursing facility clinically eligible have a right to appeal that determination. And also people who are determined to be financially ineligible have a right to determine or to appeal that determination. Um, and folks should call us if they have questions about that. And just to give folks a sense of sort of the, the benefits that are available through the waiver, um, we just wanted to share this nice infographic. We see a lot of people getting personal assistance services um, where they have an aide in their home that can help them with their activities of daily living and things like shopping and cleaning and, and um, stuff like that. Lots of folks get meal deliveries, um, but they can also get job coaching, vehicle modifications, um, home modifications. There's a lot of services that are potentially available through the waiver. Um, especially if you have a good service coordinator um, who can help you um, understand and access these benefits. So we are currently seeing a ton of service denials for people in the CHC waiver program. So we wanted to remind folks that um, people are supposed to get written notice of any service denial or service reduction and that people can and should file an appeal. Um, they can file a grievance with their health plan. If the community health choices plan wants to reduce the services they're getting through the waiver and their services can continue while their appeals are pending if they appeal within 10 days of the date of the mailing of the notice. Um, and we have a new publication on our website about handling appeals when personal assistance services are being denied or cut now up on our website. Um, just there are so many of these cases right now. The plans are really um, pushing to reduce people's services. And, um, you know, sometimes we've seen really good results in filing an appeal and there's no risk 
to file an appeal. So um, we certainly encourage people to do that. And the same thing is true for Medicaid eligibility. If folks appeal quickly, um, they can keep their benefits while their appeal is pending. Um, and that should not be an issue right now because of the COVID protections that Aaron talked about. So life is still available as an alternative. Um, if people don't wanna go into community health choices for uh, the waiver or don't want to go into a nursing home. So life is an alternative for people who need long-term care. They qualify for that long-term care um, level of care because they're nursing facility clinically eligible, but would prefer to receive their services through a community center rather than in a nursing home or at home through the waiver program. Um, we did want to remind people that if you enroll in a LIFE program, LIFE becomes both your Medicare and Medicaid coverage and that you're limited to seeing doctors in that LIFE um, program. So just a couple quick examples um, to go over how this works, how these insurances work together. Um, Jack is a dual eligible with original Medicare, a prescription drug plan, and UPMC community health choices. And he sees some specialists and a dentist. So Medicare is going to be his primary coverage. Um, it's going to pay first for specialists, but it won't cover his dental care because original Medicare doesn't include dental coverage. Um, his community health choices plan is going to be his secondary coverage for visits to his doctors or other specialists, and then will be his only dental coverage. Um, so that his community health choices plan can pay second to Medicare for specialist visits, even if those doctors are not in the CHC plan network, but the dentist must be in the UPMC community health choices network in order to get paid. And Patty is just a slightly more complicated example. She's a dual in a special needs a DSNP plan for her Medicare, and she chose Amera Health for her community health choices. She's diabetic, has heart pro problems, and also takes over-the-counter meds. So for her doctor's visits that are Medicare covered, her DSNP will pay first. Um, Amera Health CHC will pay second. For her diabetic testing supplies, her Medicare plan will cover that. And then um, Amera Health community health choices plan, her Medicaid plan will pay second. And then for her medications, all of her prescription medications um, will be covered by um, her Medicare plan. Her ex because she's on extra help, that will limit her Part D copays. And then AmeriHealth will cover her prescriptions for over-the-counter medications. So we wanted to leave you with some resources for who to call um, if you need more CHC information or help. And we are really encouraging people who are having problems with their community health choices plans to call the OLTL participant help, helpline with complaints and also to file complaints directly with their CHC plan when they have problems. Because the state oversees these plans and collects that complaint data. And if they don't see complaints from consumers, they seem to think everything is fine. Um, at the Health Law Project, we, along with other advocates, have um, meetings with state officials to talk about the problems that we're seeing in community health choices, but they really want examples um, and they like hearing from consumers directly in addition to advocates. So there's just a couple more um, resources on the community health choices program. And then um, we wanted to leave you with a prize 1-800-MEDICARE in our office as sources of help um, for people who are um, who have both Medicare and Medicaid or Medicare only. Um, these are all places folks can call for help. And I will stop there. I think we have a couple minutes left for questions. Okay, well, right now there aren't any questions because um, Erin has been answering them. Thank you, Erin. She's been typing out some answers. Um, but if you have any lingering questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A uh, box in the next couple minutes, or, or uh, we'll end a little bit early. Yep, 
And just to remind folks, we'll send out a recording. Everybody who registered for the webinar um, should have received an email earlier this morning from me with the PowerPoint and the zero premium plan list, as well as the DSNP listing for um, all the counties across the state. So if you did not get that, um, send me an email and I will, um, I will send that again. Um, I just wanted to kind of quickly just reiterate some questions that people asked. Can I, could everybody see the answers, I guess, when I answered? If so, Kevin, do you know that? Um, not, I, I don't know necessarily. I think there's a way that you could have said everybody sees it or you could have sent it privately. Okay, Cindy says yes, they could see the answers. Okay, all right. Well, then we don't need to give you any of, the, um, any of those questions. And I guess, I think um, Kayla's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Judith asked if um, we can send out a copy of the chat Q and A. I think that's something that we can that we're able to do. So I will look into that um, and and try to attach it to the follow up materials that we send if I'm able to attach it. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that at the end of this webinar, of like a one minute survey will launch. It's just three questions, um, and it's really helpful to us. Um, so that way we know what works in a webinar and what doesn't. And so that way we can keep refining our webinar process so we can keep bringing you um, the best quality content that we have. And I think this sounds like a good way to end. Lester left a comment that said, Aaron is awesome and PHLP rocks. <laughs> and I think let's end it there, right? <laughs> That's fantastic. <Lester>. Definitely. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for joining us today. We know it was a lot of information and we appreciate you being so engaged in all your questions again. All right, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.